Good evening. In the next 40 minutes, hundreds of viewers will see faces and events that they'll find familiar. Now, if that happens to you, here are some of the detectives and BBC researchers who are waiting for your call. Here's the number, and here, after the shortest of maternity leaves, is Sue Cook. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, the programme I missed seems to have been one of the most eventful ones, but more about that later. For tonight, we've reconstructed a small-time break-in which turned into attempted murder of a police officer. An audacious jewel theft from a stately home and the skilful medical reconstruction which may help you identify a murder victim found in a London street. And we have an Aladdin's cave full of furniture and bric-a-brac. Perhaps some of it is yours. We start with a small-time burglary in the west of Wales, a burglary that very nearly resulted in someone being killed. In the reconstruction you're about to see, several of the witnesses have relived their experiences in the hope that you'll remember some of the incidents that led up to the crime. The events took place a month ago. In fact, our film begins on the evening after last month's Crime Watch. It's Friday, April the 15th, just outside Carmarthen in David. This is Great Mill's do-it-yourself store on the Pensarn Industrial Estate. At about 6.30, staff remember seeing two men who'd come to buy some tools. Ninety-nine. Well, that's expensive. Should be about one seventy-five. Forty-eight, please. Okay. It's now about forty-five minutes later, thirty miles down the A40 in Haverford West. The men bought a silver and blue insulated carrier bag. One ninety-nine, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Police in Haverford West need to hear from anyone who saw those men that night. It's now 3 a.m. In Prospect Place, just off the main A40, a driver saw a reddish car that had been parked awkwardly. A few hundred yards away, at Haverford West Football Club, the men were trying to disable the alarms. Having prepared the football club for a break-in, the men then moved up the hill to the rugby club, where again they tampered with the alarms. They left a number of footprints. But did you spot the men on the roadside that night? As they walked back, they threw away some tools. By about 20 to 4, they were back at the football club. Unknown to the men, they triggered an alarm. Police. This is an automatic alarm suspect at the Haverford West County AFC Social Club. Control 869-0117. alarm at Haverford West Football Club. Three officers, a woman and two men. There's still someone in there. You stay around the front. I'll go around the back. At this point, an audible alarm went off. Ah! 
The policewoman then gave chase on foot while the car went round the back. About the same time, a local market trader on her way to work saw a man running across the main road. Just after she turned onto the main A40, a red car pulled out past her at speed. The next day, police began to piece together the events of that night. At Withybush General Hospital, it became clear that PC Nigel John had serious head injuries. His skull had been fractured, and as a result, he'd suffered convulsions. Doctors say he was lucky to survive and are uncertain about the degree of his recovery. So, what began as a burglary is now being treated as attempted murder. The man who's leading the hunt for PC John's attackers is Detective Chief Inspector Chris James. How is Police Constable John? Well, he's now been discharged from hospital and he's progressing slowly but steadily. Uh, he did receive a, a bang, a clout on the head with this instrument, a heavy-handled screwdriver uh, with great force. Were these local lads? Well, um, we keep a, a very much an open mind on this, but um, it would appear that they came in from outside our, our force area. Now, their accents weren't very distinct, it seems, and it does seem they came in using the A40 and went out on the A40, so perhaps they're from South Wales somewhere. That is correct, yes, indeed. Maybe even back from Carmarthen back towards England. They, they bought those tools in Carmarthen, of course. You need people, presumably, who saw them in that do-it-yourself store. That's right. Apart from the sales assistants who actually sold the, uh, the items, uh, we've had no one come forward yet to say that they saw them in the, in the store or in the car park if they left in, in a vehicle. We've had no sightings of them, you know, leaving, leaving the area at all. And where did they go in Haverford West after they been into the Swan service station and bought those uh, insulated carrier bags? Well, between 7 o'clock and 3am uh, the following morning, on the Friday night uh, and Saturday morning, we have no idea whatsoever. We've made numerous inquiries and we would, you know, we would very much like to know, where, in, in fact, where they were. Give us a description of the men as far as you've got it. Well, the, the video fit, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the assailant won, he's approximately 5 foot 11 and he's thin milled and he's got short, light brown hair and uh, it's described as wispy and he's, he, he had a light stubble when he purchased the items. Uh, the second person is five foot eight, five foot nine tall. He has a plumper face, a plump face, and he's stockily built, and he's got dark brown uh, short hair. Their red car, incidentally, might have been uh, a Datsun Violet 140J model. We're not sure on that. The number to ring if you think you can help is 018118055. Now, you can ask for a BBC researcher if you prefer. Alternatively, you can call the incident room at Haverford West. That's on 0437 double three double five Haverford West double three double five well I said that last month had been eventful in fact all three reconstructions brought new evidence to light as a direct result of one of our appeals six people have been charged with murder but first the stabbing on the train that apparently motiveless killing of Deborah Lindsley on a journey to London Victoria five more passengers on that train have come forward because of our appeal and as a result of the video fit we showed, police are now checking on a number of suspects. One prime suspect, though, seems to have been eliminated. Remember the man who was seen washing off blood in Victoria Station? A football supporter who'd been in a fight said that that was probably him. Another viewer reported seeing a knife and some clothing in a park. Several items have been retrieved by the police, although we don't yet know if they are connected with Deborah's death. The phone lines almost melted with calls about the armed robbery in Millwall in East London. If you remember, the wife of a security guard was held hostage and under threat that she'd be killed, her husband did as he was told. The robbers, in the end, took almost three quarters of a million pounds. Now, there was a crucial development while we were still on the air with Crime Watch. A viewer led police to the white van that was used in the raid. In fact, it had been parked outside his house. Several callers thought they recognised the Crime Watch video fit and a number of underworld figures have offered information. Presumably, they're attracted by the huge reward in this case. The investigation is progressing, we're told, rapidly. 
And who could forget those two indomitable ladies from Conholt Park on the Wiltshire Hampshire border? Early on the morning of March the 26th, Miss Mills, the housekeeper, was woken by noises downstairs. Miss Gaskell, wake up. We've got intruders. Heavens. Where's my dressing gown? Well, the thieves got away with £30,000 worth of antiques and valuables. As a result of the programme, a number of names have been offered, and we hope we can give you some more news on that soon. Now to Incident Desk. In London, the murder of a security guard. And in Kent, the theft of six arcade machines. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, that little boy who disappeared at 6.30 yesterday evening. Six-year-old Jason Clear had gone into the public toilets at the quayside at Itchener near Chichester. He's not been seen since. The sea, air and land search has failed to show any sign of him. Now, Jason is three foot six inches tall with mousy coloured hair and brown eyes. He was wearing a red jumper, green shorts and dark navy Wellington boots. He had a sticking plaster on one knee. If you've seen him, or if you were on Itchener Quayside yesterday evening between 5 and 7.30pm, please call us now. Or you can call the incident room on 0243 784433. That's Chichester, 784433. Remember last month we asked you to help us with an arson attack near Exeter? Clive Bidolph was the new landlord at the Gissons restaurant. And early on Tuesday the 1st of March, there was an arson attack at the premises in which Mr Bidolph died in the fire. Well, thanks to your calls, we've been able to close one line of inquiry and open a new one. We now need to trace a Datsun Bluebird car. We've only got half the registration, though. F-Y-M. And we also need to trace people who were at the Gissons the night before the fire, February the 29th. One caller asked specifically about the date of the fire. We particularly like them to call again. Now an attempted robbery that tragically turned into a murder. Stanley Curtis had only been working for Security Corps for five months. He'd been unemployed for over a year and was very glad to be back at work. At 12.30 on Wednesday the 20th of April, he and another guard were making a routine collection from the Midland Bank in Tottenham Court Road in London. A man approached them and without warning shot Mr Curtis at point-blank range. The other guard bravely refused to give up the money and the gunman left empty-handed. He's described as white, six feet tall, approximately 30 years old, heavily built with dark stubble and dark hair. He was wearing motorcycle gear, had a nylon courier type bag over his shoulder and was carrying a red crash helmet. The assailant escaped on a motorbike which had been parked nearby in Beaumont Place, just next to the bank. This is the route he took as far as we've been able to track it. He headed down Huntley Street and Kappa Street and abandoned the bike in Mortimer Street opposite the dental hospital. Where he went from here, though, remains a mystery. Witnesses who saw the bike being dumped in that street remember seeing a man who locked himself out of his red Austin Maestro car. He's not connected with the crime, but we're anxious to trace him in case he can add any information. But back to that bike, it's a Honda VT500E and was stolen from the City of London on the 27th of January. When it was found, number plates, like these, were on it. They're fairly unusual aluminium type with stick-on figures. If you work in a shop that sells these and made this one up, you could help solve a murder. Thieves hit the jackpot when they stole a lorry from Ramsgate in Kent as inside were arcade machines like these worth £25,000. They just arrived from Belgium where they're made before being delivered to arcades around the country. The lorry was stolen from Truro Road in Ramsgate on the 12th of April and was found the next day on Tunbridge Road Industrial Estate near Romford. In all, six machines were stolen. Five of them were like this crane type, though four of them had good luck signs written here. One of these gold run machines was also stolen. It's worth about £9,000 and there are only 13 like it in the country. So keep your eyes peeled and your money to yourself. And if you can help with this or with any of our other incident desk cases, you know the number 01811 8055. And there's a missing person from incident desk, as you may have noticed. David's colleague, Helen Phelps, has left the police, but we didn't want to lose her from the programme. So now in civvies, Helen has joined the Crime Watch team full time. 
Her first assignment involves an extraordinary piece of medical detective work. Two months ago, on the morning of Saturday the 12th of March, the severed limbs of a woman were found in East London. The woman had been dead for between 24 and 48 hours, and so far her identity is a complete mystery. And that's where police need your help. Here's Helen's report. London Docklands. Once dominated by wharves and warehouses, it's now been transformed. Private homes, office blocks and leisure amenities now make up the skyline. With these developments has come a dramatic drop in serious crime, but unfortunately, it's not been eliminated. This is the East India Dock Road, the A13, a main road through the area and always very busy. Just off this road is this house. It's a woman's refuge and it provides sanctuary for women in fear or in danger, so we won't be given the building's exact location. Sometime between 6.30pm on Friday the 11th of March and the early morning of Saturday the 12th of March, someone approached the front of the refuge, climbed the steps and went up to the dustbins. Whoever it was left some neatly wrapped black plastic packages by the bins. At 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, one of the residents of the refuge was putting some rubbish out. It was then she noticed the packages. The packages contained two arms and two legs. They belonged to someone who was white, as these police drawings illustrate. There was no further clue to the person's identity. The officer in charge is Detective Inspector Bill Cutts. Well, obviously, we have very little to go on to begin with. We had the, the four limbs and all we could say that they were the limbs from a woman, uh, an adult woman, and she was white. So I had to get a team of men together, and then the real hard work, police work began. Now what we're going to do, it's a lot of hard work. Dave's going to be the exhibits officer. Trevor's going to be the office manager. The rest of you are going to be investigators on it. Now, Peter there is going to check up on all missing persons, women, reported since the 1st of January this year throughout the UK in the 20 to 50 age group. And Dave and Reg, I want you to get in touch with the local social services uh, and check out all women that have come to notice through domestic problems going back to the 1st of January last year. Governor, are there any marks uh, on the limbs that are going to help us to identify this woman? Yes, we got some, the nails for a start. They're bitten right back, suggest that a woman living on her nerves, very nervous, they're quite ever so short, and obviously may have suffered prior to the incident a lot of worry on her mind. On the big toe, red nail varnish, no trace of it on the fingernails. The wrist, appears to be some scar in there. We're not sure what that is. We're going to have to rely on the forensic layers and the pathologists, and we haven't got much more than that. Whilst the police were continuing to check the files of missing persons, already there was a picture emerging of the victim, and there were more clues to come. A crucial part of the investigation was a forensic examination of the limbs. This was conducted by Dr. Vanessis, a home office pathologist. We felt initially that uh, it was from a fairly young person uh, and subsequently we, we were of the firm opinion that she was a lady of the late 20s, early 30s age group. From the, uh, the size of the limbs, she must have been a fairly uh, well-built uh, young woman and we felt she was at least 10 stone, possibly up to 11 stone in weight. We have estimated her height, and uh, we worked it out to be about 5 feet 7 and a half inches, give or take an inch either way. Were there any indications, Doctor, she wore jewellery? The strongest indication was uh, an indentation of the middle finger of her right hand, which indicated that there had been a ring there. Did she have any distinguishing features? The most interesting thing was a number, were a number of scars on the left uh, wrist and forearm, which were typical of someone who had attempted suicide by cutting their wrists in the past. What about the legs? The interesting thing about the legs was that the left leg in particular was slightly longer than the right leg, although there, she would not have had a noticeable limp. 
uh, there was a very tiny fracture of one of the long bones, um, which um, she may even not have noticed, but it's possible she could have fallen over on that leg and caused that fracture. Uh, she seemed to be a person uh, who was um, very active, uh, maybe perhaps did a lot of dancing in her time. Um, certainly, she, we had the impression that she wore high heels quite frequently from the way the toes were crowded. In addition, she had um, joining of two toes, which was on both feet, which is a congenital abnormality, which although would not have given her a lot of trouble would have been quite noticeable to someone who'd known her well. At the Metropolitan Police Laboratory, the forensic examinations continued. We found out her blood group was Group B, which is a fairly unusual group. In addition, we looked for uh, various drugs to see whether she had been on either uh, hospital medication or whether she, in fact, had taken an overdose, and we found that there were trace amounts of uh, benzodiazepines. One of the group of these drugs is Valium or Librium, that sort of drug. So she may have in fact been on tranquilizers. These small but critical points have now been fed into the police computers. Initially, the police had very little to go on, but from scientific tests, they now know a lot more about this woman. She probably suffered from depression and may once have been suicidal. It's known she took the tranquilizer diazepam. This woman was used to suffering, and she may have confided in someone. The police don't know who she is, but someone watching probably does. So just to recap, here are the main points again. She was aged approximately 30, and about 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighed about 10 stone, and was of medium build. She was of nervous disposition, with badly bitten fingernails, and multiple scars on her left wrist. And police have one further clue. At 9.30 on the night of March the 11th, that's the night before the limbs were found, a man was seen sitting in a car parked just off the East India Dock Road near the women's refuge. The car was a dark blue Cortina, and the man smoking a cigarette and wearing glasses was described as of Mediterranean appearance. If you think you may know the woman or if you can identify that man, please call us now. You can talk to the detective in charge, or if you prefer, a BBC researcher. All calls will be treated in absolute confidence. The number to ring is 01811 here, or you can call the incident room at Limehouse Police Station direct on 01488 5212. That's 01488 5212. Well, already we've had over 200 calls here to the studio. Information is coming in right now on the London shooting, and I hope to bring you news of that before we come off the air tonight. Also on the Bowood house robbery, a number of people have, have called in about where those number plates came from, and I gather a lot of the calls tally. So, again, we'll try and give you more news of that before we come off the air. Some more news from last month's programme. Our incident desk led directly to a number of arrests. We showed a plaster cast of a face. It had been modelled on the remains of a badly charred man's body that had been found near Blackburn in Lancashire. A viewer identified the victim as Sabir Killu, who lived in Leicester. The police went to interview a family, and as a result, six people have now been charged with murder. And last month, we asked you to help trace con men who were using forged cheques to buy cars. You might remember a viewer realised he'd sold his BMW to some men just hours before the programme and rang us. The next day, the conman tried to sell the BMW at a garage in East London, but the garage owner had seen the programme too, and he called the police. The conman made off, and later the BMW was found abandoned in the same area, and it's now been returned to its owner. He has now compiled for us a photo fit of one of the men who's been described as about 25 years old, height about 5 feet 9 inches, with designer stubble and a pronounced Adam's apple. And while we're on the subject of cheques, we showed a picture of a woman who was wanted for handling euro cheques that had been stolen in the Midlands, then cashed in Mallorca. Well, soon after the programme, a woman went to a police station and she's since been charged with a number of offences. Well, now to Aladdin's cave, a treasure trove of property recovered by the police, may be stolen, and who knows, maybe some of it is yours. From a garage in the police yard at Taunton in Somerset, John Bly. Behind these vast iron doors, there's a surprising Aladdin's cave. And what we want you to do, as usual, is to look out for anything that might have been stolen from you in the last year or so. And what better to start with here in Taunton than a pair of stoneware 
cider barrels made by the Taunton Cider Company. Very collectible objects now. And in contrast, look at the quality of this tiny little ivory figure. She's a Chinese deity, but has lost her original stand and now sits on a little handmade round wooden base. Now that might jog the memory of somebody. And then we've got a set of lobster forks. Just think of the lobsters not eaten because they've been lost. And behind me here, a great range of wardrobes and cupboards, Art Nouveau and Victorian. And amongst all that furniture, there's got to be one lovely piece, and there certainly is. Look at this. This is a three-panel front carved oak coffer in the 17th century style. This one, beautiful quality that it is, was probably made about 1880. Made, I bet, by someone's grandfather. Now, amongst all the wood and furniture, we've got some brass. We have bells and bellows and warming pans. But look at these. I wonder what they are. They're a wonderful colour underneath, and they've been made into something quite recently by the addition of these brackets. I bet somebody will ring in and tell me. At least I hope they do. And now to the written word. What a wonderful way to learn history in the book here produced in 1784. That was the year the Prince of Wales was 21. We don't know who this is because we don't have any writing in it, no name at all. But we do in this common prayer book where we have Roy Luton, Christmas 1923, and this little book of church services belonged to Mary Sharp from Bridgewater in 1871 when she was aged 10 years old. Now, it says here, good trunk, circa 1820, William IV. Well, I'm sorry, you can have one but not the other. You can't have both. This is William IV, all right, 1830, and what a good trunk it is. Look at this. We've got secret compartments here. Presumably, you put love letters in there, and then here you had the paper in which you could write them. Isn't that wonderful? Now, on to some sad damage now. And I say sad damage because it certainly is. However, it might help us identify this jug and basin because this damage on both sides I guarantee was done some long time ago, and it might jog someone's memory. So too is this here, this great chunk out of this rather lovely globe on the Victorian oil lamp. And finally, for this section, look here. There's a wonderful pair of Dalton vases, one of which has been so badly smashed as to could a, put a hole in the middle. Nevertheless, somebody has actually tried to fix it with some adhesive, hence those brown stains. So we might turn it to an advantage yet. And now we've got a collection, or I suppose a chime of clocks. But what I really want to show you to end with is this marvellous Victorian piano, this walnut case with all the tracery along the front, retaining the original material, these fantastic cabriole legs. Unfortunately, it's a wooden frame piano, so it needs a bit of a tune. But I hope that that will strike a chord with somebody. Well, if it does, if there's anything there you recognise as being stolen within the last few months, do call us 018 or call the Bridgewater Police, that's 0278 458 161, Bridgewater 458 161. Well, I'd like to ask you now to remember what you were doing on the May bank holiday weekend. That was just the weekend before last. If you visited one of England's stately homes, Bowood House near Chippenham in Wiltshire, you might be able to help police find £150,000 worth of unique pieces of jewellery belonging to the Earl of Shelburne's historic family collection and the thieves who took it as well that weekend. Our reconstruction begins in Wiltshire at Bowood House itself. Bowood House has been the home of the Earl of Shelburne's family since 1750. Now they open the house to visitors to keep the estate together. Bowood had been open to the public only four weeks when the robbery happened. It's a quarter to six, closing time, and most visitors had gone for the day. But upstairs in the jewellery room, the guard was surprised to find a man and a woman lingering on. Very security conscious, eh? They really are beautiful. Are they real or paste? Uh, there's a description on the other side of the cabinet, sir. What would happen if someone was to steal them, eh? Come on, I think they want to close. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, madam. This is Long Ashton Golf Course, just outside Bristol. On the 20th of April, someone went into the club locker room to steal a set of car keys. false plates were fixed onto the stolen MG Montego. They'd been bought the same day from a shop ten miles away in Avonmouth. 
On the A342, the main Chippenham to Devizes road is one of the entrances to the Bowood estate. This gate is only unlocked when the rhododendron gardens are on show in May. Just three days before the robbery, the gardens were being prepared for the opening that weekend. This gardener remembers a blue Montego. Morning. Morning, sir. Is it open yet? Not for the weekend. Thank you. Hello. This was the gate the robbers were to use for their getaway. The Montego was seen again on the morning of the robbery, Friday the 29th of April. It was the bank holiday weekend. Just up the road from the rhododendron gardens is this lane. At 10.30 that morning, a farm worker noticed two men standing at the boot of a blue Montego. A red BMW was parked just in front of it. Fifteen minutes later, another witness saw the BMW there, but now it was on its own. A woman was waiting in it. At about the same time, the Montego was again on the Bowood estate. This farm worker saw it heading for Bowood House. Meanwhile, at the main entrance, a woman seemed to be signalling, perhaps to a taxi that was seen leaving at that time. Minutes later, she was with this man at the ticket office. Two adults, please. 540, please. 540, please. Do you any change? It's not a 40p. No. That's right, I've got something. Thank you. The cashier remembers the woman kept her face turned away. Shortly after that, nearer the house, a steward saw them at a bench. Good morning. Morning. Isn't she feeling well? He noticed she behaved rather oddly. She's a bit faint. Okay. Thank you very much. They must have stopped only for a minute, as by ten past eleven, they were inside the house. Upstairs, the curator, Kate Fielden, was preparing for the day. I thought I'd probably have time to clean a showcase which was looking a bit dusty before the first visitors arrived. And I was suddenly aware of a couple. I noticed that they went straight up the stairs, which is a bit surprising because people normally walk around the first floor first. One floor up and behind the heavy door, the thieves were out of earshot. Police think the tools they used must have been hidden under their coats. I locked the showcase. I didn't dally. And I had the feeling that as I went down the stairs, they didn't follow immediately after me. It was as though they were dawdling a bit. Perhaps they were trying to avoid me. That was a quick visit. My wife's not feeling very well. I'm taking her home. Oh, I'm sorry. As they left the shop, they bumped into the same steward again. Hello, is she all right now? Uh, no, not quite. You can use our restroom if you like. Uh, no, thank you. Where do you right? go? All right, then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. The Montego was seen flashing its lights, presumably a signal. And minutes later, the couple were seen leaving the grounds in it. Police found blood on the gate. Perhaps she had cut her hand on the showcase. They abandoned the Montego in the lay-by and must have left in the red BMW. That was found a week later in this car park in Melksham, eight miles away. So, Mr Legg, what exactly did they steal? Well, these are well-documented, unique items that have been stolen from Bowood House. One is Admiral Lord Keith's chelling, which is a diamond ornament um, in, in the form of a brooch. And the second one is um, a Sultan's Medal from 1801, a gold star with a moon design in the middle. And a watch. And this is the watch, yes. All these three items are uh, well-documented, they're unique and... Um, 
So they're going to be difficult to sell if they're they, unique? They will be difficult to sell. Um, any person who actually has offered these items will know where they come from. So they may be broken down, which would be sad. Yes. We have video fits of the couple. What descriptions do you have of them? This is the first person who was actually seen, not on the day itself, but some days prior, acted suspiciously. She described as 50 years, uh, uh, sorry, 30, 32 years, 5 foot 9, black hair cut in the fringe, styled at the rear. She's got fresh complexion and she's a slim build and she's said to have a refined home county's accent. And the man? And the man, this is the man who was again seen with her on the day. Um, he's 50 years, 5 foot 10, proportionate build, thick dark hair, clean shaven with sharp features, said to be tanned, wearing thin framed horn rimmed spectacles and a grey green peaked cap. And I gather you have a suspicion that the woman on the actual day of the robbery might have been, in fact, a man. Yes, on the day, he, uh, the, the female, who we think may well be a man, was spoken to by a member of the staff and replied in a gruff voice, and mm. we've good reason to believe that could well be a man. Right. Now, they fitted false number plates to the red BMW. We've brought replicas of them in here. Yes, um, these are false plates. In so fact, does... this number has not been issued, and we would like any person who recognised having made up number plates with this number uh, to contact us. And also, anybody who remembers selling these tools, which they managed to smuggle in under their coats, quite ambitious in, it, in itself, yes. does anybody recognise those tools? All these tools were left at the scene. They're new tools, um, and we'd like to know from any person who's actually sold these tools to anybody. Right, thank you very much. And if you can help in any of those ways, or if you've seen any of the jewellery, ring us here on the usual number, 01811 or you can call the Devizes Incident Room direct on 0380 77311. That's 0380, the code for Devizes, 77311. Now to photo call TV's version of the Rogues Gallery, with some exception exceptionally sharp pictures from security cameras, David Hatcher. On the 2nd of February this year, a security camera at Southampton's High Street branch of the Alliance and Leicester Building Society recorded this man entering the building and approaching the cashier. After threatening her with a gun, he eventually left with nearly £600. Have a closer look at him. He's described as being between 30 and 40 years of age, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 9 inches tall and having a tanned complexion. If you know who he is, please call us. Maybe you recognise these two men. In March last year, they opened an antique shop in Scarborough. Then in February, they vanished after bouncing £6,000 worth of cheques. The one in glasses called himself John Peters and the other Michael Peters. They always had this small Yorkshire terrier with them. It was called Butch or Boo Boo. John Peters, the younger and shorter of the two, wears tinted glasses. The other, Michael, is about 41, 6 foot 2 inches tall, with dark brown hair with slight grey streaks. He has a pronounced squint. Look at them together again. Perhaps they've set up a shop near you. Next, we need your help to identify two gunmen who terrified customers and staff by firing a gun through a security screen. It happened on the 8th of April at a branch of Barclays Bank in southwest London. The gunman and his accomplice demanded cash from two of the tills, filling a hold all with over £6,000 before making their getaway in a black BMW which had been stolen nearly two months before. Take a close look at them. The gunman is described as being 5 foot 9 inches tall and about 35 years old with black hair and a dark moustache. The other man is also 5 foot 9 and aged about 30. Someone must recognise them. If you can put a name to either or both of those faces, call us now. Finally, we'd like to trace this man. On the 31st of March at 4.45 in the afternoon, he walked into the Alliance and Leicester Building Society in Mutley Plain, Plymouth. He took out a revolver and threatened the assistant behind the counter. He got away with a substantial amount of money. He's described as 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10, late 20s to early 30s, with a gaunt face and slender build. He was of scruffy appearance with shoulder length, dark brown, greasy hair. He was wearing a dark bomber jacket and carrying a white plastic bag. Give us a ring if you recognise him or any of our other photo call faces. If you do know any of those faces or their whereabouts, here's the number 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. 
And I see we've had some very useful calls on a number of our cases, including on the East London woman. Quite a number of people have actually come up with names for that lady, so some of the leads are very hopeful. More news on that. It's been a busy night, in fact, tonight. The lines are open until midnight, though, so keep trying if you haven't been able to get through yet. And you'll find a list of the local police numbers on CFAX, page 186, if you have that. And you can write to us, of course, at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. Sorry we haven't been able to give you the more definite news. I thought we would, but we'll be back with Crime Watch Update at 11.10 and we'll have more news on open air tomorrow at 5 past 12. Obviously it takes uh, everyone's involvement to conquer crime, young and old, rich and poor. In fact, crime tends to hit the poor even harder than the rich and the young more frequently than the old. So if you can help crack it, do join the hundreds who are calling in right now. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>